Good morning. Welcome to Green Lake Church. Welcome to worship in Green Lake Church. We're delighted that you can join us this morning for our time together in worship. It'd be great if we could be together in person, but we can connect electronically and spiritually heart to heart. So welcome. We're delighted that you are with us. To begin our service, we have a prelude by our Minister of Music, Wanda Griffiths. Wanda? Welcome again to Green Lake Church. We're delighted that you can join us for worship this morning for our connection here uh, electronically as we worship God and have a sense of shared faith and community. I hope that you were able to join one of the Sabbath school classes this morning. I checked in with a couple myself and it was fun to see everybody and hear your voices. We have a number of announcements today and we begin as we usually do with our birthday list. And I've asked uh, Tad Ishikawa if he would give birthday greetings this morning. Tad? Good morning. Today we have four birthday greetings. And so the first birthday greeting is for Sophie Parvis. And the second one is for Oliver Filings. It was good to see you in Sabbath school today. And uh, have a happy birthday. The next uh, birthday is for Carla Walters. Happy birthday, Carla. It was nice to see you at the supermarket the other day. I haven't seen you in a while. And the fourth birthday greeting is for Kai Dorr. Sorry I missed you in the Sabbath school. I think I was in the other Sabbath school. So we wish that you have a happy birthday this week and may God give you many blessings for the coming year. Thank you. Back to you, John. Thank you, Tad. And yes, I'll just add my um, greetings, uh, happy birthday wishes to uh, the folks that Tad mentioned. Thanks, Tad. Let's see, coming up, we have lecture series, November 14 and 15. That's Sabbath and Sunday, November 14 and 15. For those of you who have been keeping track, Originally, lecture series was scheduled for this month, but uh, we needed to move it. And so it has now been scheduled for November 14 and 15. Our presenter will be Sigve Tonstad, and his theme will be 
uh, in the Gospel of John. I'm really looking forward to his presentations. I think you'll appreciate them. Yesterday, I attended, I was at Cypress School, electronically speaking, to do worship for the uh, kids. And there are a bunch of kids on Zoom. And we talked about cows and uh, things at the farm. And it was fun seeing all the kids. School seems like it's going well. Uh, and so we will continue to wish them the best as they navigate this school year under difficult and complicated circumstances. I, I met, got to a couple of Sabbath schools this morning and I know there are other Sabbath school classes meeting this morning. Again, I just wanna remind you that if you're watching here for church, um, if you would like to, uh, the opportunity to connect more interactively is available before this at the Sabbath school time. Oh, I think our newsletter, um, our, our Thursday email included a link for a Zoom gathering after church today. Th that uh, was a misprint. Um, we do the gathering after church on Zoom on the second Sabbath of the month. So we'll do that again in November. Uh, a couple of uh, notes here. The pastoral search process is going forward. And part of that is developing a new strategic plan as a congregation. Um, th the committee has developed a survey, which the link for it was in the Thursday email. Uh, Scott Callender will have more to say about that a little later in the service, but I just wanna put a shout out there. If there's any chance that you can, please fill out that survey so that we can uh, get the make good progress on developing this new strategic plan. So be listening for Scott here in a little bit. Also, for uh, at least some of you would have received an email yesterday or the day before from Carolyn Lacey as part of the nominating committee development process. If you received one of those emails, please respond as soon as possible. That'll help us as we uh, move forward and helping uh, find people to fill the various positions we need to keep moving forward as a community, as a congregation. Okay, oh, now Shelly Legrone is here and she is going to introduce our junior choir. Shelly, thank you for all that you do with the kids and with the bells. Um, and now thank you for introducing the choir. Thank you, good morning. Today, the junior choir members, each singing from the safety of their own homes, will share a story with you. It's a familiar story. It's found in each of the four gospels. Listen carefully, because you will have a part in telling this story. One day, a very large group of people followed Jesus out into the countryside. They were hoping that Jesus would heal their bodies and also show them how to handle the uncertainty of their lives. Reaching a pleasant spot, they sat down and Jesus talked to them. Later that day, the disciples advised Jesus to send the people home because there was little or no food available for them out in the country. They explained they had been able to scrounge up a couple of fish and a, and a few loaves of bread, but that would never be sufficient to feed all of these people. Well, you know what happened. Jesus blessed those few fish and the couple of loaves of bread and the multitude was fed. Yes, the multitude. And we know that Everybody was full because it says at the end, there was more than enough. And they actually picked up 12 big basketfuls of leftovers. It was a miracle. Our song, More Than Enough, is a reminder that God will take care of us. A lot of people need to know that right now. The three stanzas in our song tell the biblical story. And there is also a chorus or refrain that is sung a few times. And that's where you come in. The third time that chorus comes up, there is going to be, you will see on your screen, the words for this chorus. 
and I want you to plan to sing along. Here's what you're going to sing. Jesus gives us more than enough. More than enough. Jesus provides us with more than enough. We may not see the how or when, the who, the what, the why. But in our time of greatest need, Jesus will supply. Thank you for singing with us. Please remember these words. Uh, our Minister of Music, Wanda Griffiths, will introduce other elements of music in our service. Wanda? Thank you, John. And thank you, Shelley. It was great to hear a little bit more about the song. I've been able to preview the video, and it's lovely. You've done a great job, and the kids should feel very good about oh, thank that. Thank you. Thank you. I think so, too. <laughs> They're good. great. I have fun. <laughs> Great. The uh, other special music today will happen during the offering time. And this is a piece that was recorded last November, just about a year ago, uh, when the Walla Walla Valley Academy Orchestra was at Green Lake under the direction of Ben Gish. And the piece that we are, are is called Water Lily. Josiah V. Oh, and so I did reach out to Cheryl and ask, is this any relation? And is their nephew. Uh, he is the son of Alwyn's, who is also a very fine musician. Um, and so we're just delighted to see young uh, musicians playing in our space and to see Josiah doing music and being featured that way. Uh, then the other, the postlude is again, uh, me on the organ with one of the new recordings that Gumi uh, made last, uh, last week or so. And so we're very pleased to be able to share sometimes piano, sometimes organ uh, for the prelude and postlude. And then um, I think that is all we need to tell you about special music, except continuing to save December 18th as a date to watch the virtual candlelight Christmas concert. We're very excited about all the plans for the music groups uh, putting music together for that. 7.30 on December 18th. Uh, so now we will proceed to worship with our opening hymn, which is number 12, Joyful, Joyful, We Adore You. Thank you.
Let's pray together. Creator of earth and sky and sea, maker of rocks and birds and trees and all that is, thank you for calling us into worship this morning and receiving us with your smile. Lord of the nations, we pray that you would hasten the day when swords are turned into plowshares, spears are turned into pruning hooks, and justice rolls down like the great river. Lord of our hearts, work in us and through us. And the week to come, make us agents of your kingdom, partners with you in accomplishing justice and peace. Is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning. Today's offering is for church ministry. And when we think about church ministry, usually we think about giving money uh, to the church for the future and all the things that we need to accomplish as a church and a congregation. Well, this week, I'm asking you to give money, but I'm also asking you to lend a little bit of your time. We have started a Green Lake Church uh, Strategic Planning Committee, and we are looking at all of our strategic goals for the future of the church. And as part of that goal, we need you to take a survey to give us feedback on what you want to see for the future of our church. In the email that went out this week, uh, we have a link that you can go to to take a survey. It'll take you about 10 to 15 minutes, and it will ask you all kinds of questions about how you see our church and how you see the future of our church going. So please take the survey. Uh, we will again send you another reminder next week, um, but we're trying to finish this up in the next couple weeks so that we can build a new strategic plan together. Uh, thank you so much for your offering and for your time this week. Let's bow our heads. Dear Lord, thank you so much for all the blessings you've given this church congregation, and I pray again to give us extra special blessing as we're thinking about the future of our church together, and pray that you guide us with wisdom on how we form our future, and bless the offerings that are given virtually this week, and help them to go to your good as well. Thank you for your love, Lord. Amen.
Welcome to Children's Storytime. As a child, I wanted to go fast, and I heard trucks when I was in the crib, and I bounced and wanted to go fast with them. I liked running and running races and riding bikes fast. And then I got to be on a helicopter firefighting crew as a flight manager, and that was really fun for going quite fast. And so now, ironically, as a traffic engineering specialist, I have to deal with all that speed. And so what are some ways that I've dealt with it? Well, one thing, I've just uh, developed the first unique device that we put on the road, and it's called optical bars with crystals. And they're special crystals that can shine through water. And so that's one of the ways that I've helped deal with speed. And we'll take a look at those here. And you can see we have just put some in and the crystals show up very good in the dark and the wet. Okay. But, you know, it's interesting that I learned some first principles about speed focus from Jesus. And so you might want to look up Matthew 19:14. And I'll tell you a few more things about what I do, and then we'll come back to that. And so, uh, first to illustrate, um, my work now is helping travelers get there more safely. And there's a couple points I'll tell you about. One is with increased speed focus extends out or quite a bit down the road. And at times this is a normal function, okay? but then you have times where in a children or pedestrian activity area, there needs to be a more inclusive vision that is needed. And so for that kind of situation, we say that there's both a periphery vision and it works well if you're at an absorbable speed. And then there's also the concern of children's eye distance judgment their distance judgments not developed until about age eight. And to really bring that into focus, if you will, or to demonstrate it, I have a picture here and at 40 miles an hour, your vision narrows and looks out there to the distant. And when you're going slower, say 20 or 25 miles an hour, your vision broadens and you can see more of what's happening with children in the area. And so there's the example where you can see the top is broader, where you're going slower, and you can help the children be safe when they're crossing because you're taking time for them. And then the bottom one is fast, which of course you wouldn't want to go through the children's area. And thus, for instance, how I deal with school speed zones, we put them in at 20 miles an hour. Okay, so let's come back to the Matthew 19, 14 that I talked about. And there it says, let the children come. Don't hinder them. Heaven belongs to such as these. Well, what's embodied in those words? Well, it's really that we give to them. We help them grow their vision. We help them broaden their vision where it's helpful and help them focus their vision. And really, how can we do that? You know, when we're working with children, we um, get to know them, we gain their affections, and we teach them to work well with others and be very comfortable with others. And when all of that is together, where people know their environment, then they can work well in crossing different circumstances together, like we just saw in the crosswalk, or as we gain their affection and they follow us, we can show them a longer term vision. And part of that is bringing their attention and their affections along so that they understand the best ways to be safe and get to heaven. Thank you very much and have a good day and Sabbath. Please bow your heads with me. Dear Lord, in a time of uncertainty, we ask you to bless our congregation with comfort. Today, we are claiming your promises. We ask for strength that you promised to give, to hold us up. We ask for peace because we know you have already overcome. We are ready for our wings so we can soar above the chaos like eagles. 
and we are happy to be still while you fight for us. We thank you for your promises and ask for them to infuse our souls this coming week. We ask for special strength and healing for Ariana, Becky, Davey, Ed and Alma, the Green Lake Church Child Care and Preschool, Glenn, Jennifer, Nola Jean, and Roger. Thank you for the work and healing you are already doing in our lives. Please send an extra dose of blessing this week. We love you, Lord. Thank you. Amen. The Old Testament reading is from Jeremiah 7, 1 through 6. The Lord gave another message to Jeremiah. He said, Go to the entrance of the Lord's temple and give this message to the people. O Judah, listen to this message from the Lord. Listen to it, all of you who worship here. This is what the Lord of heaven's armies, the God of Israel, says. Even now, if you quit your evil ways, I will let you stay in your own land. But don't be fooled by those who promise you safety simply because the Lord's temple is here. They chant, the Lord's temple is here, the Lord's temple is here. But I will be merciful only if you stop your evil thoughts and deeds and start treating each other with justice. Only if you stop exploiting foreigners, orphans, and widows. Only if you stop murdering, and only if you stop harming yourselves by worshiping idols. Jesus provides us with love. 
Jesus will provide. Jesus gives us more than enough. More than enough. Jesus provides us with more than enough. More than enough. More than enough. We may not see. The New Testament reading is from Matthew 23, verse 29 to 31. What sorrow awaits to teachers of religious law and you Pharisees? Hypocrites, for you build tombs for the prophets your ancestors killed, and you decorate the monuments of the godly people your ancestors destroyed. Then you say, if we have lived in the days of your ancestors, we would never have joined in killing the prophets. But in saying that you testify against yourselves, that you are indeed the descendants of those who modeled the prophets. May the Lord bless the hearing of the world. Thanks, Gemma and Soraya for the scripture reading this morning. And thank you to Shelley and the, all the choir members for that great music. Thanks so much. Appreciate it. In Frontier, Mont Montana, Stealing was a capital offense. If you stole a cow, you were dead by hanging or by a bullet. And it was range justice. It was frontier justice. There were no fancy lawyers, no long deliberations. It was an unappealable, irrevocable sentence. You were lights out dead. <laughs> Cattle stealing was serious business on the frontier. Don't do it. An acquaintance of mine, uh, a friend, uh, Fred Cornforth, was reminded of this frontier justice recently when he happened on a historical monument, uh, a historical marker, at a viewpoint overlooking the Yellowstone River over in Montana. Um, the marker said that he was standing near the location where white settlers in the 1860s had killed 40,000 bison. They had taken the hides and made a little money on that. They left the meat to rot there on the plains in Montana. Um, by the 1870s, Indians in the area began getting into armed conflict with the white settlers. Um, and, and Fred, as he was looking at this historical monument, talking about the slaughter of the bison, and thinking about the sort of the myth of frontier justice that, you know, you steal a cow, steal a horse, and you're dead. You know, vigilante, immediate justice. If you were caught, you were hanged or shot. And began thinking about these 40,000 animals that were slaughtered by the settlers. 40,000 bison that belonged to the Indians. And he was wondering if the penalty for stealing one cow was summary execution, what would the penalty be for stealing 40,000 of the Indians' cows, so to speak, the Indians' bison? Um, it's a haunting question. And of course, as, as conflict between the Indians and the settlers ramped up, there were massacres by the settlers and by the American army. Uh, on occasion, whole villages were wiped out in, in bloody massacres. Whole villages of Indians were wiped out in bloody massacres. Now, you know, if, 
if you had said to those settlers that slaughtering all those bison, that that was stealing, they would have been deeply offended. They weren't stealing, they would have said. They were just taking care of their family. They were doing what they could to get by. That's the way they saw it. They didn't think of themselves as thieves. They thought of themselves as hardworking people, taking care of their own, taking care of their family. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's taken centuries for us as a nation to, to even begin to acknowledge the savagery of our beginnings. You know, we celebrate our nobility and our goodness. And we had some big ideas and ambitions back there in the beginning as a nation, but there was also a lot of savagery on our part. Most people want to do what is right. And one of the first ways we, we understand what is right and what is wrong is we think about what's good for my people, for our people, for my family, for my class at school, for my unit in the military, for my company, for my church, for my country. We, we think of what's right and wrong as what's good for my people, good for us. Loyalty is a wonderful thing. It's an important human virtue, but it can be subverted. Sometimes loyalty gives birth to evil, and that's where the job of prophets come in. The job of a prophet is to help us see clearly from a moral and spiritual perspective Maybe we could say it's their job, especially when loyalty blinds us. And we see this vividly in today's scripture reading, our Old Testament reading, reading again from Jeremiah chapter seven. God gave a message to Jeremiah. Go to the entrance of the Lord's temple and give this message to the people, God said. Oh, Judah, listen to this message from the Lord. Listen to all of it who worship here. This is what the Lord says. Even now, if you will quit your evil ways, I will let you stay in your own land. Some background here. At this point, Judah, Jerusalem and the Jewish nation is under pressure from the Babylonian Empire. And Jeremiah has been challenging the people to repent and do right. He's been threatening doom if they don't. So this message is, is really just a, a further development of what Jeremiah has been saying. But notice this, these twin elements of, of warning and promise. He's saying, even now, if you will repent, if you will do right, God will rescue you. And then the warning. But don't don't uh, pacify yourselves. Don't falsely reassure yourselves by saying, well, God's temple is here. So of course we're safe. So of course we're okay because we have God's temple. Jeremiah says, you say the Lord's temple is here. The Lord's temple is here. That's this translation. In another translation, it simply reads, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord. The people are chanting, celebrating their identity. They were Jewish people after all, the special chosen people of God, the people God had rescued from Egypt. They worshiped in the temple that had been erected at God's direct command. Their form of worship had been dictated by God through Moses. They were special. They were God's people, and the temple was the great symbol of that specialness. How could they be at risk? Because they had the temple. God's temple was right there among them. God's presence in a special way was living in the temple. Their temple, they said. Jeremiah went on. Here's what God says. I will be merciful only if you stop your evil thoughts and deeds and do what? 
start treating each other with justice. Only if you stop exploiting foreigners, orphans, and widows, only if you stop murdering, only if you stop harming yourselves by worshiping idols, only if you do right, will I let you stay in this land that I gave your ancestors to keep forever. Notice that. God says, look, my intention was you'd be here forever. But your wrongdoing is messing up my intention for you. Don't be fooled into thinking you will never suffer because the temple is here. That is a lie. That's what Jeremiah spoke, speaking for God. Again, it's important for us to affirm the temple was the center of the Jewish religion and the temple had been set up by God's direct leading. In the temple, they had a form of worship that had come straight from heaven. The Jewish people were rightly proud of the temple. No other nation had the house of God as their capital. No other temple had, no other nation had a temple with the living presence of God in it, the, the special presence of God in it. The Jewish people had been selected by God. So when they thought of themselves as special, you know, they were not inventing that. They weren't making it up. And Jeremiah is not contradicting this notion that they are special. What he is doing is challenging them to not be fooled by loyalty. Yes, they were loyal to the temple. But Jeremiah says, that's not enough. You have to be loyal to the foreigner, to the orphan, and to the widow. You had to be loyal to those who had no power claim on you. Yeah, the foreigners were not going to advantage them. The orphans were not going to advantage them. The widows were not going to advantage them. There was nothing in it for them, financially speaking status speaking. These people could not help the, the uh, prominent citizens of Jerusalem. Still, Jeremiah says, God is on the side of those little people. If you want God to be on your side, you have to do right by those little ones. So how did Jeremiah's work go? How was he received when he challenged these people about their loyalty and their confidence in their place because of the temple? Well, if we go to chapter 26, we, we see that we, we see a picture of how difficult Jeremiah's life was. It's not easy being a prophet. I don't think I would want to be a prophet. <laughs> Scholars think that Jeremiah chapter 26 was written shortly after chapter 7. Now, they're probably within the same year, within, within a single 12-month period. Here, here's Jeremiah chapter 26. The message of the, of the Lord came to Jeremiah in the reign of Jehoiakim, son of Josiah, king of Judah. Here's what the Lord says. Jeremiah, go stand in the courtyard of the temple of the Lord and make an announcement to the people there who have come from all over Judah to worship. Maybe they will listen and turn from their evil ways. And then I will change my mind about the disaster that I am ready to pour out on them because of their sins. So notice the aim of Jeremiah's message is repentance and, and he's hoping things will turn out well for his nation. He's gonna speak hard words, but it's not because he doesn't like his people, because he's not loyal to them. In fact, it's because he is loyal to them that he delivers his stern message. He wants them to repent so that things will go well for them. Verse four, this is what the Lord says. If you will not listen to me and obey my word, and if you will not listen to the prophets, because I have sent them again and again to warn you, but you wouldn't listen. If you won't listen to the prophets, then I will destroy this temple the way I destroyed Shiloh. I will make Jerusalem an object of cursing in every nation on earth. Now, if you are a Bible scholar, you'll recognize the word Shiloh and you go, 
Oh, yeah. I remember Shiloh being mentioned in the Bible. That's where David had set up the, the tabernacle, the, the, the portable precursor to the temple. So what happened to Shiloh? Fact is, we don't know what happened to Shiloh other than this little reference here. It, it simply disappears. And the prophet hints at it, that disappearance was not a good thing. Shiloh disappeared. It was destroyed for disobedience. And so Jeremiah is saying, hey, look, if you're not careful, the same thing is going to happen to the temple here in Jerusalem that happened to Shiloh. You don't want that. And when, Shai, when Jeremiah said that, he was challenging the Jewish people's sense of, of self and sense of place. I, how, how dare he say that Jerusalem, the center and pride of the Jewish people, could become like Shiloh, a place that had vanished off the map, a place that had become nothing. Well, <laughs> We don't have to guess how the people uh, responded. Verse 7, the priests and prophets and all the people listened to Jeremiah as he spoke. But when he finished his message, the priests and the prophets and all the people at the temple robbed him. Kill him, they shouted. It was frontier justice. <laughs> what need did we have for a trial, they said. We don't need witnesses. We have just heard him ourselves. He has questioned our national pride he has committed treason and and they mobbed him they grabbed him now fortunately they didn't actually kill him in the moment um, while this was going on and while they were hollering and shouting at him asking him what right he had to speak these blasphemous words these treasonous words the officials of judah heard the commotion, and so they rushed over from the palace and sat down at the, the new gate of the temple, which is where court was held, and told everybody, okay, come on over here. We've got to hear this out. So it says that the priests and the prophets dragged Jeremiah over there and presented their accusation to the, the, the nobles that were sitting there in judgment. Now notice and this is a, a challenging element of this text. Notice that it says the priests and the prophets brought Jeremiah before the court. And you're thinking, wait a minute, but I thought Jeremiah was a prophet. Jeremiah was a prophet. Prophet was kind of a role in society. And the haunting thing is, if we had been there, if we had been there when Jeremiah was there, and we were part of, quote, the people we hear jeremiah saying doom is coming to this nation because you have not been kind to the foreigner you have not been kind to the orphan you have not been kind to the widow you have been harsh and severe to the poor and over here you have people who call themselves prophets saying don't worry god loves israel we are the people of god you are the people of god God wanted you to be prosperous. God wanted you to be powerful and strong. Enjoy it and don't worry about what Jeremiah is saying. If you had prophets saying those two things, how would you figure out which one was the authentic prophet? Which one was the word from heaven? Which one was the word of God? It would have been a challenge. One set of prophets would be making us feel good. We're rich, we're strong, we're powerful. We'll do what we want. And then over here is this other prophet saying, be careful, your wealth is seducing you. Your power is blinding you. Your past success is making it difficult for you to learn and hear the word of God. Who do you listen to? Notice, Priests and prophets, they told the, the nobles what Jeremiah had been saying. And then they said, this man should die. We, you have heard, uh, they said to the nobles, you have heard with your own ears what a traitor he is. He has prophesied against this city. He should die. Have you ever heard that before? Do you hear it in our society today when somebody speaks up? When somebody protests injustice, we go, 
that's not being loyal. You know, when Colin Kaepernick knelt in protest against violence against his people, people said, that's treason. That's not loyalty. Well, was Jeremiah being loyal when he said the temple itself is going to be torn down because you have not treated the lowly ones right? We need to be careful about rejecting the words of rebuke. We need to be careful about confusing rebuke with treason, rebuke with being disloyal, rebuke with being unpatriotic. Because the prophets always, <laughs> seems like always, they were giving rebukes, but they were patriotic to their country, they were loyal to their God, and they were faithful to their people. And part of that loyalty and patriotism and faithfulness was speaking the voice of conscience. Jeremiah spoke up in his own defense. He said, it's the Lord who sent me to prophesy against this temple in the city, he said. God gave me every word I have spoken. If you stop sinning and obey God, he will change his mind about the disaster that I've been predicting. As for me, he said, I'm in your hands. What can I do? You do what's best. But if you kill me, you'll be killing an innocent man because every, you know, everything I've said is not, I'm not just making this stuff up. God gave it to me and I'm announcing the word of God. Verse 16, then the officials and the people said to the priests and the prophets. Now, if you read through this chapter, you notice that early on, who was it that grabbed Jeremiah and mobbed him? It was the priests and prophets and people. The people were offended by Jeremiah's words. Now, after a court has convened and, and the, the emotion level is brought down just a little bit and people are hearing all sides, notice that, quote, the people switch sides. And now the people and the nobles are saying to the priests and prophets, wait a minute. This man does not deserve to die. You know, I'm reminded of the importance of due process. You know, in recent months, you know, police violence against uh, has, has been, you know, in, in the forefront. We've been given a lot of th thought to this. Why, why are police killing people? You know, and then just Thursday, there was another incident. A police officer, a Seattle police officer, shot at a man who was running away. And when you hear that, your first reaction, oh, that's terrible. Get that police officer. But with due process, you hear more of the story and you realize it's a complicated mess. No, the officer should not have shot at a man who was running away. Fortunately, he missed the man. And other officers arrested him without further violence. But when you hear the whole story, you see how complicated some of these situations can be because the man, had thrown a burning stick into the officer's car and set the car on fire while the officer was in the car. He had charged at him and thrown it in there and set the car on fire. And later the man said he was trying to provoke the police to get the police to kill him. So again, no, the police officer should not have shot at a man running away. But you realize, wow, I'm glad I'm not that police officer trying to respond in a moment when there's a man trying to kill me or at least, well, setting my car on fire while I'm in it. That's, that's, that's pretty dramatic, isn't it? So due process. Here in Jeremiah, there's due process and the due process saves Jeremiah's life. The mob was going to kill him, but now the nobles say, no, we're not going to do it. And then verse 17, it said, some of the wise old men spoke up. And, and said this, they said, remember when Micah of Morasheth prophesied during the reign of King Hezekiah of Judah. This is 50 or 100 years earlier. They said, another man, Micah prophesied. And he said, Mount Zion, that's Jerusalem, will be plowed like an open field. Jerusalem will be reduced to ruins. And the old men said, we didn't kill that prophet. Instead, King Hezekiah led a national move of repentance, and the Lord spared us. You know, 
sometimes <laughs> you often hear me say, we need to listen to the young people. We need to listen to young zealots calling for change and forward movement. And that is true. And we also need the counsel of wise old people. In this case, it's the wise old people who could remember when somebody who might have been labeled an enemy of the people, this prophet, was in fact recognized as a spokesman for God. I think in our society today, you know, journalists, typically news is typically negative. They're like the prophets. You know, this is wrong, that's wrong, that's wrong. They, they reveal scandals. And so lately, some people have taken to calling journalists enemies of the people, just like the prophets were. But some of us are old enough to remember when it was journalists with their negative reporting that stopped a president from uh, dangerous ambitions. Some of us remember when negative journalism revealed the dishonesty and, and, um, and government propaganda behind the war in Vietnam. You know, prophets, journalists are like prophets. Their job is to offer rebuke. And when they are negative, often that's because it's their job to be. And we need to listen carefully, not swallow and believe everything that we hear, but we need to listen carefully and not be labeling those who rebuke and those who speak negative truth as enemies of the people. This chapter mentions a disturbing incident. There had been another prophet named Uriah who had prophesied similar things to Jeremiah. And he had been arrested and killed for his prophecy. And you're going, well, then how is it that Jeremiah escaped if this guy Uriah got it? The last verse in this chapter is a curious verse. And at first glance, you just read right by. It says, nevertheless, Ahikam's son of Shaphan stood up for Jeremiah and persuaded the court not to turn him over to the mob to be killed. So who is this guy, Ahikam? son of Shaphan. It turns out that the family of Shaphan, and there's three generations of them, Shaphan is the granddad, then there's Hikam, and then the, later on a couple of uh, the next generation show up. These people, they are, it's a noble family, they have power in the nation, and over and over again they defend Jeremiah from those who are trying to kill him. The prophet would have been killed, except Ahikam, son of Shaphan, stood up for him. My question to us, will we be like Ahikam? When, when prophets stand up and speak the truth, when prophets stand up and oppose those in power, when prophets stand up and remind us of our duty to the foreigners, to the orphans and the widows, these groups of people that are over and over again championed by the prophets in the, in the Bible. When prophets stand up, speak up, and challenge us to be godly in our regard for these lowly ones. Will we be like the mob shouting, crucify him, kill him, stone him? Or will we be like a Ahikam, son of Shaphan, and stand up and say, wait a minute. We need to hear the truth. We need to do right. We need to practice integrity. We need to practice generosity. That's what God expects of us. And that's what we will commit ourselves to as the people of God. Now it's time for our closing hymn.
Let's pray together. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. Amen. Thank you for being with us here at Green Lake Church today for worship. We pray that in the week to come, you will indeed find ways to live your faith. Uh, obviously, we will live our faith and we pray that it will be the faith of Jesus that will make us agents of peace and justice. Next week, uh, Sabbath school at 9.30 or 10. There's five or six classes here at the church for every age. So we hope you can join us for that. And then uh, next week at 11 o'clock, join us again for worship as we open the word of God. We open our hearts in singing and lift our hearts in prayer. Hope to see you next week. And now to close our service, here's our minister of music, Wanda Griffiths with our postlude. <laughs>